This is Strat News Global. I'm Amitabh Revi and you're watching The Talking Point. Well, let's uh, get started uh, to uh, introduce my guests. Joining us from Chicago is uh, Dali L. Young. He's the William Claude Rivas Professor at the Department of Political Science at the University of Chicago and the author of several very uh, relevant books about uh, China. Professor Young, uh, sorry for pulling you out of bed so early in the morning, but thank you for coming on Strat News Global. It's my pleasure. And uh, close by, but uh, uh, another time zone in New York is uh, Yashio Wang. She's the China re researcher with the uh, with Human Rights Watch and a columnist. Uh, Yashio, Ms. Wang, again, good morning to you in New York and a very warm welcome to Strat News Global. Thank you so much for having me. Our pleasure. Professor Yang, we'll be looking at uh, the new Chinese policy shift in terms of uh, three child policies now. There is so much distrust of uh, what comes out of China in terms of everything. You know, I mean, they're even uh, tearing up decade-old agreements that they've had with India effectively. These numbers that uh, have come out in the census, I mean, do you trust them to give the correct picture? I mean, they could be worse, right? The gender gaps or anything else that we're looking at? Well, censuses by nature are large-scale surveys, and especially when mm -hmm. we are down in a year of the pandemic, so there are clearly limitations. Uh, but of course, uh, all many governments do carry out such censuses. Uh, let me simply put it this way. Um, there are always some issues with the data, but China's is more reliable, generally speaking, because of the ability of the Chinese government to mobilize people to participate in the censuses and so on. But again, though, there are challenges. And that's also why scholars carry out additional surveys and also the Statistical Bureau to uh, try to gauge what's going on uh, and so on. And also we do have the trend as well over time. So therefore we know how the trend is shifting and the trend is generally speaking highly reliable. Right, Ms. Wang, now this trend that Professor Yang is talking about was evident and uh, every, uh, lots of academics and analysts were pointing out the problems that China was facing, whether it's economically, demographically, apart from, of course, the moral uh, or ethical question. But uh, do you, th why now? Why have they announced it now? And especially, you know, we expect big announcements, at least from the outside, uh, at the National People's Congress or something. This was soon after the census. Well, I think it's a very you know, belated move because uh, experts, uh, also just regular people, are calling for the government to abolish the two-child policy many years ago. Because I think people are know know that you know China facing an aging population. But uh, in terms of why they just announced like a week after the uh, the census, probably that's related because the census clearly shows China is having a uh, demographic woes. Right, we're seeing some of uh, uh, those statistics laid out in graphs in terms of uh, China's birth uh, per thousand people there when the one-child policy was announced and then the two-child policy. But uh, Professor Young, post that two-child policy, there wasn't really a baby boom after uh, a population increase maybe for a year or two, but did it really work? Uh, well, it worked very marginally, and which is why mm. currently there is this effort to increase the number of permitted children. In other words, it's not exactly shifting, saying that you have to have three children per couple, yeah. but in fact, that is only you couples can. are allowed to legally have three children. So in that sense, there is a big difference from the uh, restraint on fertility in the 1980s to the shift back uh, is not as coercive as uh, clearly when the family policy uh, was imposed in the 1980s. And of course, the big challenge is, of course, fertility behavior, once they have shifted, it's very hard to nudge them, to ch change them, on, unless you really change the institutions undergirding many of the behavioral changes. Women, for example, who have gained the freedom uh, uh, in fact, to sort of uh, uh, clearly have hesitance 
the eco economic structure have changed as well, and the social structure have changed. And as a result, actually, people haven't have gotten used to the one child per couple policy, especially in urban areas. Right, we just talk about uh, the social changes that have happened, but Ms. Wang, when we saw that graph about uh, the gender disparity, uh, just explain to people who may not be familiar with uh, the Chinese social and demographic figures and what the problem is in terms of an aging population, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, more men than uh, women who are in the childbearing age. What is the problem uh, that uh, the Chinese Communist Party sees? Well, I mean, let's talk about, you know, what I study, which is gender discrimination mm. in the workplace. Mm. Uh, for 35 years, from 1980 to 2015, China had the one-child policy. For women in, you know, most in urban settings, of, uh, you know, you mostly can ha only have one child. So for employers, you only expect a female employee to take one maternity leave in, you know, their lifetime. So. Uh, you know, I mean, China traditionally, uh, the job market always favors men because they think men are capable, men are more intelligent. Also because, you know, child care falls uh, heavily on women. So the employers favors men, but you know, with one child policy, you only uh, expect uh, women to take one maturity leave. So with the two child policy went into effect in 2015, there is an uptick of more discrimination against women in the workplace as a result because well when you as a woman you go apply for a job you are facing a you know a prospect employer and the employer might think okay you for women who have not had any children well you it's possible that after i hire you you're gonna take one or two maternity leaves why and for women who have one child one child the employer will think well, I don't know. Maybe after I hire you, you're gonna take a, uh, you know, some months off to have another child. So for women who have already have two children, and the employer might think, okay, you already have two children, and you may be too busy taking care of children, so you might not be able to focus on work. So, well, my, why not just hire a man rather than hire a woman? So this is what happened during two child policy, which I, you know, I observed. So this situation could even be worse when the three child policy goes into effect you know the employees you may want more more less willing to hire women as a result professor yang just taking a question from one of our regular viewers uh, shai desi who says hi panelists it's to both of you will xi jinping's popularity plummet in china because of this uh, policy how are people in china reacting to this policy change Professor Yang? Yeah, uh, first of all, this is not as sudden as it looks because already there has been adjustment in the policy in recent years. And of course, uh, leaders, when they relax policies, they tend to become a little more popular. In many ways, this is part of the tools for the Chinese leadership to try to connect with the people. And in this case, offering a little favor uh, because again, I mean, most governments do not try to manage fertility in such a way and it's only in china on such a scale that the party the government actually say oh i tell you how many children you can have and that's very unusual globally it shows actually in the chinese case the fundamental premise and remember china introduced this the draconian family planning policy in 1980 that's actually at the start of the economic liberalization and reform so in other words you had a situation where the Chinese government was beginning to relax uh, restraints on the economy while at the same time simultaneously imposing uh, extraordinarily draconian family planning policy. So the two actually went hand in hand and that same government power has continued to this day. Ms. Wang, if you want to take that, because I've seen a couple of your tweets when you're talking about the reactions on um, Chinese social media, a uh, lot of rebuke, a lot of uh, people saying that, you know, nothing is going to change for them because there are other circumstances, social and economic, which uh, will not allow that to happen. Is that uh, a correct assessment? Yes, yes. There are just so much cynicism on the Chinese social media. Uh, it's um, entertaining to, uh, you know, read people's comments. You can see there's just so much creativity in this cynicism. 
Well, you know, one person was saying, you know, I don't buy a Rolls Royce. It's not because they put yeah. a limitation in the number of Rolls Royce I can, you know, buy. Um, I think, you know, because people are saying that I didn't even have a second child because I couldn't afford it, not to mention three child. I mean, it concerns access to education, access to uh, housing, access to health care. So if the Chinese government really wants to incentivize people to have more children, there needs to be, you know, a, they need to really spend the uh, you know, money to boost the social services. Professor Young, explain to us uh, the demographics in terms of why the government is worried economically. I mean, China became the hub, a manufacturing hub, uh, because of its workforce, but because of the aging population and the costs involved there, plus uh, youth not replacing them, in the economy is that a worry to continue its uh, the economic progress is that one of the main reasons professor Yang? well yeah there is an argument demography is destiny but of course to some extent right uh, as you just emphasized for many years china has enjoyed a certain demographic dividend it had a very large uh, population uh, reasonably well educated hard-working uh, labor force that's ready to do the manufacturing. And that's shifted and beginning uh, uh, about 15 years ago, for example, the structure began to change. There are fewer people uh, now who are able to do the kind of manufacturing. In fact, even today, there are many people who would rather ride bikes doing the delivery rather than working in the drudgery of the factory. But that doesn't mean that it automatically slows down the economy because factories are raising, enhancing, and investing in automation. And that actually is extraordinarily important. China is one of the largest investors and buyers of uh, robots uh, into uh, in factories. So uh, just because actually the population is aging somewhat does not automatically slow down the economy. In fact, if you have the population suddenly a lot of babies that are being born, it actually decreases, uh, 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 in fact, the uh, labor force, as Yachu has implicated in some ways, because those women who are be uh, bearing children will need to be out of the labor force uh, for the you know, short run. So in fact, and also because of the children's dependency ratio actually uh, uh, increases uh, in the short run when there are a lot of babies that are being born. So the, what the Chinese government is trying to manage, therefore, is dependency, both young and old, uh, again, which is very unusual globally. Uh, but of course, this is how the Chinese government has functioned, uh, generally speaking. And of course, if the popular, really, when there are no replacements in terms of the other extreme, when there are no babies, of course, eventually the economy will have to decline. But in the short run, uh, uh, however, is actually uh, uh, less of a worry. What the Chinese government is worried is about 10, 15, 20 years down the road, uh, uh, actually. And of course, especially as other countries are growing their population. But of course, to some extent, because uh, part of the reason the Chinese government de uh, decided to increase, uh, to actually impose the policy of population control was actually trying to slow down and also stop the growth, growth of the population. In many ways, they succeeded a little bit too well uh, for their own good. Mm. Uh, Yachiu Wang, I'm just going to take one comment and one question uh, for you. Uh, Ma Tarao says, given China's work hours, it was extremely hard for women to handle both work and home. Only rich people in China can afford uh, two or three kids. And then she also asked this question, are there any studies on the psychological impact on individuals, especially women, because of such uh, draconian population policies? Well, it is very hard for women to, you know, have children uh, also, uh, you know, goes to work. China, Chinese women actually has a pretty high, you know, work, uh, you know, workforce participation rate comparing, especially comparing to women in other countries. So traditionally, I would say, you know, especially if you're in an urban setting, women go to work. But then again, the other side of the tradition is that women, uh, you know, child care work, housework, uh, force heavily on women. So women have only one hand go to work, uh, you know, have a full time job. On the other hand, I have to take care of children. It is a lot of work. So, you know, I, for my research, I've, you know, read so many social media posts uh, uh, written by women who, you know, who complain about just, you know, the kind of work, both at 
at the job, also at home, they have to do. So they are more, re when the two-child policy was in effect, they are more reluctant, usually they are more reluctant than the man to have a second child. Even, you know, there were like huge arguments about, you know, I don't want to have a second child, my, my, my husband won or my in-laws won. So, I mean, this is a result because women, you know, uh, have to do more housework and more childcare work. Uh, Professor Young, you, you addressed uh, the economy and the problems that can arise maybe in the, in the future as well. But decades of this uh, one-child policy and then, you know, how society works, it's happened in India as well, when the male child is chosen uh, over females, that we've seen in, in the graphs, the, the disparity between the two genders. How does it affect, the, the or does it affect and how does it affect the Chinese military? Well, yeah, that's a great question in many ways. And let's keep in mind, at this point, the the population that are the prime uh, uh, age for childbearing, in fact, on the generation of only children now, generally speaking. So therefore, clearly, when you have a generation of only children, there are issues related to, to uh, how are the parents willing to, uh, to allow their only sons to go into the military and to die uh, in many ways. So clearly that's an issue. There have been also health aspects because uh, uh, clearly there have been challenges for the Chinese military to recruit uh, able-bodied men, uh, partly because, for example, myopia and other kind of issues. And the Chinese uh, children tends to be spending so much time in school so they are not participating as much actually uh, physical activity. But overall though, and as in the case of India, for example, uh, the population base is very large. Of course, the size of the Chinese military is very large, but at the same time so far, it hasn't had much of a difficulty in recruitment. Um, but again though, uh, if it doesn't increase the number of young people and especially young men currently because the Chinese military focuses on re recruiting uh, men into the military scale, uh, mm -hmm. then clearly there may be an issue down the road. But at the same time, however, the military recruitment is shifting more into the population who are educated. Uh, so again, there have been adjustments being made by the Chinese military in terms of recruitment, in terms of gender, in terms of education. And also they are shifting the rhythm, used to be the focus on a particular time period during the year. Now mm -hmm. recruitment is practically year round now, which again suggests that there is some pressure in recruiting, in finding, uh, finding actually the right number. Uh, of uh, uh, man for the military. Uh, just a follow-up question, Professor Young, to that. Uh, uh, in terms of psychology, if now if it's a one a one uh, child policy, it became two. Yes, but if it was only a single male in a family who was sent to the military, and now we've seen even deaths for I think for the first time uh, with uh, India in many many decades. Does that uh, psychologically, is there any backlash from uh, society or from families, especially when it's one child, even if it's uh, just one male in the middle? Well, uh, so far, no. Uh, in fact, there are okay. parents who send their sons to the military in order that they get the discipline because <laughs> it's the one, uh, one child and so on. There have been some disciplinary issues. Uh, of course, this doesn't have to be one child. Uh, so in that sense, actually, uh, so far it's, it's been okay, uh, let's put it this way. But of course that does mean, of course, unlike in the US, for example, we have been fighting wars for such a long time. In the Chinese case, uh, border skirmishes and wars have been very rare for the last 40, 50 years or so. Uh, of course, there was the war against Vietnam, so that's really the most significant, uh, significant exception. Uh, Matara is taking part in this uh, uh, discussion and just taking one of us. Women always end up doing most of the housework in almost every country in the world. That's, of course, uh, very true. But uh, just getting you in, uh, uh, Yachi Wang, in terms of women in rural areas and women in uh, urban areas, is there any uh, difference in how they react to policy directives like this? Well, I have to say, I mean, what we can observe on social media are mostly from women who are in urban areas, who are women, mm -hmm. actually, actually women, because that their population who go on uh, social media and to tell 
the uh, you know the world that uh, you know I'm not happy with the three child policy because you know I it's too expensive and I have to do other work. So it's I mean then if you read some uh, uh, Chinese media who interview women in rural areas, um, I think it's a similar similar you know it's because the same thing they have to do the work or that they have to take care of the child. But I think the difference is that in urban setting, I feel women are more empowered to say no when they don't want to have a third child, when they even want to have a two child because they're more economically independent. They're more educated. They have more choices. But if you're in a rural setting, even you don't want to have a third child, uh, you know, because you're less economic and independent, uh, you're less educated, you have fewer choices. It's harder to resist the kind of you know pressure from your husband or your from from your family. Professor uh, Young, just uh, taking another comment or a query, which uh, asks: I hear that China intends to encourage migration from ASEAN countries and other countries into China to counteract this uh, demographic. Yeah, there is no official policy uh, because clearly if China officially does something of that nature, uh, I think <laughs> the neighboring countries may not be too happy with that. Uh, so, but at the same time, we do know there have been it's particularly women who are married into Chinese families uh, from North Korea, from Laos, Cambodia, Burma, uh, and, and Myanmar, uh, uh, and so on, uh, Vietnam in particular also. But the challenge, uh, again, at this point is those women who are married into Chinese families over the last 20 years or so, Chinese immigration policy actually makes it extraordinarily difficult for those women to gain the kind of uh, citizenship in China. So the current immigration policy actually discourages such practices. And we also know some of the uh, women may not have been actually uh, peacefully uh, invited into those families. There have been issues with trafficking and so on. So in some ways, the uh, flexibility with respect to the number of children that are being born may actually help to alleviate some of the pressures in terms of gender imbalance that has happened in the past. Uh, so there is some silver lining clearly uh, with the policy. Ms. Wang, uh, if, if it is an issue and policy has to be changed. Why make it three, uh, allow three? Why not just lift the, any limit? Well, I think ideologically, the Chinese Communist Party likes to control, like likes to control women's womb, likes to control, you know, what do you think? So probably it's just, you know, it's, uh, you know, it, it, it's, in, uh, it's tongue in cheek, okay? so you need DNA that it, they wanted to control uh, people. I think, but then, I mean, on a practical level, if you read the Chinese media, you will find some local officials see, say that, you know, we're worried that if we completely relax the policy, there will be more people in rural areas, people who are poor to have more children. So, you know, in their mindset, that's, you know, put a, a burden on the society, on resources. So I think for the Chinese government, they really want educated women uh, in urban settings to have children uh, more children, but the less, uh, you know, they are less willing to give this space to women in rural areas that they feel, you know, those, they are not going to educate the children as good as, you know, women in our urban setting. Um, you know, there are other reasons. I think a bureaucratic uh, initia, I mean, there's a huge uh, work, you know, uh, a chunk of uh, employees in the government, uh, in the system that are employed to uh, enforce uh, family planning policies. So if you just lift the restrictions for, you know, where are those people who are uh, who are going to do in terms of, you know, their job? Well, a uh, completely unrelated uh, question here, but since it's addressed to you, I'm taking it. Ms. Wang, is there any possibility of a woman succeeding Xi Jinping as the Chinese brand? Well, uh, I mean, this is a problem in every country that, uh, you know, uh, women in the workforce, women uh, suffer uh, sexism, uh, sexual harassment, discrimination in the workforce. I mean, in China, uh, I would say, I mean, still, if you look at the you know top angela of the Chinese government, of, you know, business leaders, there are some women. You know, it's all like in comparison. I feel China is still doing better than some other countries in Asia. But uh, I mean, worse than some countries, I would say, you know, in, 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 in the West, like, you know, in, in in Northern Europe. Uh, so I think it's in, in, 
it's all like a relative. Um, but I, I would say, you know, if you read the Chinese social media, uh, uh, this is an important issue to them. You know, they are wanted to succeed in the workforce. Professor Young, is this uh, um, something that uh, should be looked at? This question from Mehul Lad, is there a significant difference between sudden population drop in China or the, uh, gradual and gradual population decline that is seen elsewhere because of such uh, uh, policies, coercive policies? Well, uh, uh, well, let's first uh, clarify, there is no sudden population drop in China at okay. this point, and there may be a gradual no. easing. Uh, it's a sort of, uh, but clearly in the Chinese case, the Chinese population is going to moderate and gra uh, population growth and uh, go into decline at some point down in the future. Whereas actually, especially in developing uh, countries, the population will continue to increase. So in that sense, over time already, of course, uh, only a few years ago, we are, uh, it's always said that China was the most populous country. That's already is no longer being mentioned as much, uh, given that the Indian population has grown. And of course, Africa will have a much larger population down the road as well. So in that sense, I think suddenly the Chinese feel like, oh, they don't want to be going down in terms of the size of the population too rapidly. Uh, because clearly, on the one hand, there are disadvantages to having a very large population, but there are also advantages and strength that come in numbers. Uh, India and Africa, you're mentioning the uh, clear difference there is even if the numbers are high, is that uh, 60, 70 percent are below 30. Uh, just uh, getting, uh, when I was talking, how I started off in terms of do you trust the numbers? Uh, Ms. Wang, uh, there's a question from Re, uh, Redfix. How does the three China policy interact with the CCP Xinjiang policies? You now, the figures given which suggested that, you know, uh, increase in Han population was maybe two and a half times less than uh, minority, other minorities in uh, China. And juxtapose that with what's happening in Xinjiang. And today's also, I think, uh, Xinjiang or the Uyghur conference is being held today as the anniversary of Tiananmen, but uh, separately. This uh, point that is being raised about uh, the double standards. Yeah, yeah, this is a good question. I mean, there have been evidence and reports uh, uh, showing that, you know, the Chinese government is doing, uh, you know, forced sterilization, forced abortion in Xinjiang. But again, I mean, it's very hard to access uh, uh, in, uh, any information uh, in Xinjiang, but I think some of the reports are obviously credible. Um, uh, but I think this is in the context that you know uh, the, the the one child or two child policy is mostly enforced in the Han population before. Now they wanted to relax that policy, and then in Xinjiang they wanted to you know it more enforce the part uh, the, 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 the 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 childbirth. Uh, policy in Xinjiang uh, in a way to limit the growth of, uh, you know, Uyghurs and uh, uh, other Turkic and Muslim uh, population. So, I, yes, there is a, a double standard in terms of, you know, one, they want to relax uh, the enforcement of a certain policy. On the other hand, they want to you know, increase the enforcement of a certain policy. Professor Yang, if you wanted to have the last words. Well, I think uh, what's interesting, and to follow on Ya Chu's point, uh, so historically, uh, the ethnic minorities, so many of them were allowed to have more children than the Han population generally. Of course, there are differences within the Han population as well. So the irony at this point is actually the Chinese government wants to have a unified policy on paper for all ethnic groups, including Han, including the Uyghurs, and so on. But as she mentioned, enforcement may differ uh, depending on which part of the country you are in. But overall, though, on paper now, actually, there is a unified policy for all groups, including within the Han, including for whether you are a professor or a government official or a rural person. It's the same now, suddenly. Professor Dali L. Young. Thank you so much for participating in this and sharing your experiences and analysis. Uh, we will keep coming back to you on Strat News as and when, and hopefully not so early in the morning. Thanks, Professor. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. And this is Yachio Wang. Again, it was great to have you for the first time on Strat News Global, and uh, we'll keep coming back to you for more for your analysis um, on China. Uh, and I must tell our viewers, of course, that Ms. Wang is 
a third child, and uh, she's from China. She left China, what, how many years ago? 13. 13 years, and she's a, th a th third child of her yes, Chinese Yes, legal parents. now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're now legal, <laughs> much later. Thank you so much for your time again. Both of you have a great day. Thank you so much. Good evening. So a reminder to our viewers, uh, do subscribe to our YouTube channel and click on that bell icon. You'll get notified for when we put up videos like uh, this one. Do also follow us on our social media handles on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. And do help us uh, or support us financially in uh, whatever way you can. Just uh, go to that link that is there in the descriptor. You've been watching Talking Point on Stack News Global. I'm Amitabh Brevi.